Hi, I'm Dr. Jose Favora, and I'm an internist in Arlington, Texas. Today I'm going to be talking to you about something very near and dear to my heart. We're going to go over the down and dirty on diuretic therapy. So before we get started, I want, I want to kind of reach back into the cobwebs of my medical school years and tell you guys about the three rules of medicine. And there are three of them. You get through these three rules and your patients will always do great. Rule number one, the blood goes round and round. Very important. Rule number two, oxygen, good. No oxygen, bad. And rule number three is you got to make pee. So today I'm going to focus on rule number three. And uh, let me tell you the objectives of this lecture really quickly. First of all, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the anatomy and the physiology of the nephron as it pertains to diuretic therapy. Second, we're going to discuss the specific types of diuretic therapy and what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the nephron while we do it. Third, and this is going to be interspersed throughout the lecture, I'm going to discuss the clinical uses of each diuretic class while acknowledging their potential side effect profiles. And the, the fourth objective, which is the single most important one, is to discuss the importance of diuretics as they pertain to my favorite topic, internal medicine. All right? So what are diuretics? Diuretics are drugs that promote the excretion of urine or increase the amount of urine excreted. Now that's straight out of Stedman's dictionary, all right? There are five major classes of diuretic therapy. There are the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, loop diuretics, thiazides, potassium sparing diuretics, and osmotic diuretics. We're gonna spend a few minutes going through each one of those classes today. We're gonna clear away the cobwebs here a little bit, and we're gonna talk about some anatomy and physiology. We're going to talk about the anatomy of the nephron, and we're going to talk a little bit about how all the different segments in the nephron work. Now this is really important, so I want you to try not to fall asleep on me. Remember, about 20% of the blood is filtered from the glomerular capillaries into Bowman's capsule. The kidney basically regulates the ionic composition and volume of the urine by active reabsorption or secretion of ions and or passive reabsorption of water in five functional zones. So we start out at Bowman's capsule. The filtrate is going to enter the proximal convoluted tubule. It's going to then descend from the cortex of the kidney down into the medulla of the kidney via the descending loop of Henle. We're going to get all the way down to the bottom of that medulla and then we're going to loop back up through the ascending loop of Henle. We're going to end up back in the cortex again where we've got the distal convoluted tubule. And then the filtrate is finally going to enter the collecting duct from where it enters into the ureter and down into the bladder. We're going to, I'm going to walk you through those, those sections here a little bit slower now, all right? Let's uh, talk a little bit about the physiology of the proximal convoluted tubule or the PCT. Sodium is reabsorbed via the NHE3 transporter and exchanged with hydrogen ions. Now hydrogen ions combine with bicarbonate to form carbonic acid. Now carbonic anhydrase, and we're going to get to this, carbonic anhydrase is the enzyme that I, got, I want you guys to key in on, okay? Carbonic anhydrase modulates the conversion of carbonic acid to water and carbon dioxide. Now these two molecules, water and carbon dioxide, will diffuse very freely across the membrane. Intracellularly, once they enter the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule, intracellular carbonic anhydrase is going to convert this water and carbon dioxide back to carbonic acid. Now the, the, the bicarbonate is transported via the, uh, through the inter back to the interstitium via a sodium bicarbonate transporter pump. 
and the hydrogen is available again to restart the cycle. Now, this is the basic, really basic overview of the acid-base secretory system in the proximal convoluted tubule. And the reason I went over that is because I really want you to remember carbonic anhydrase. You'll remember that at the beginning of the lecture I mentioned that carbonic anhydrase is one of the five, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are one of the five classes of diuretics we're going to go over. Now that we've gone through the proximal convoluted tubule, we're going to enter the loop of Henley. And I'm not talking about Don Henley and the Hotel California, even though sodium ions and all that stuff, they may think that they've uh, entered uh, one of the depths of hell or something like that. At any rate, the loop of Henley is the primary part of the nephron that dips down into the medulla of the kidney. Now, there's two parts to it. There's the thin descending loop, and then there's the ascending loop. It kind of makes sense, right? We're going to go down, and we're going to come back up. The thin descending limb of the loop absorbs water osmotically because of the very hypertonic medullary interstitium. By the time we reach the thin ascending limb, there's a three-fold increase in the luminal sodium chloride concentration, but the thin ascending limb is impermeable to water. So, this is when we get to the meat of the loop of Henley. We've taken a great deal of water out going down in the, into the medulla. It's diffused out. Now we're entering the ascending limb. And there's actually two parts to the ascending limb. The thin ascending limb and the thick ascending limb. The thick ascending limb is where I want you to concentrate, all right? I say concentrate, and that's because we are super concentrated at this point. This segment is also very impermeable to water. We're going to concentrate in this area on the NKCC2 co-transporter. This is the primary co-transporter in the thick ascending limb. And basically what it does is it transports two cations, sodium and potassium, across the membrane. And it also transports two chloride ions across this. So basically, we've got two positive, two negatives. We're going to stay completely electrically neutral. Now, the sodium potassium ATPase on the interstitial membrane um, drives sodium into the interstitium and drives potassium back into the cell. So we're going to increase the electrical potential of the urine. And what this is going to do is it is actually that electrical potential is going to drive magnesium ions and calcium ions via the paracellular space. So the net result is that out of the fluid now, which you know, again in this area, impermeable to water, but we've lost sodium ions, potassium ions, two chloride ions, a magnesium ion, and a calcium ion. What this does is it results in a highly dilute fluid once we get to the other side of the thick ascending limb. On the other side of the thick ascending limb, we've got back in, gotten back into the cortex of the kidney, and we're still impermeable to water at this point. The distal convoluted tubule is where about 10% of sodium chloride is reabsorbed, and it's done via the NCC transporter, sodium and a chloride transporter. Parathyroid hormone also acts in the distal convoluted tubule to reabsorb calcium. Finally, the filtrate is going to enter the collecting tubule. There are two kinds of cells in the collecting tubule, just in case you're not totally confused at this point. There's the principal cells and the intercalated cells. Principal cells are primarily responsible for sodium and water reabsorption and potassium secretion. The intercalated cells are responsible for sodium excretion and potassium reabsorption. Now, in the collecting tubule, uh, there's a little bit of specific importance that we place on aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. Both of these, both of these agents act specifically in this site. Now, aldosterone is going to work via, the via receptors in the principal cell to increase sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion. It's also going to work 
to increase the work of the sodium potassium ATPase pumps to pump sodium into the interstitium and potassium back into the cell. This is going to be particularly important later on in the lecture as well. I want to switch gears a little bit here again now. We're going to talk about the five classes of diuretics. And I want you guys to rewind for a second here because we're going to start back at Bowman's capsule again and we're going to walk our way through. First of all, we're going to talk about carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. The primary carbonic anhydrase inhibitor we're going to talk about is acetazolamide. The second class of diuretics we're going to talk about are the osmotic diuretics. These also work in the proximal convoluted tubule along with the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, but they also have a role in the, uh, in the descending loop of Henle. The primary diuretics we're going to talk about here are mannitol and urea. The third class of diuretics we're going to go over are the loop diuretics. And believe it or not, they work in the loop of Henle. Uh, that's why they're called loop diuretics. Some guy got paid millions of dollars to come up with it. The primary loop diuretics we're going to talk about are bumetanide, ethacrinic acid, furosemide, and torsemide. Now remember, as soon as we exit the loop of Henle, we're back in the cortex and we're back at the distal convoluted tubule, which is the primary site of action of the fourth class of diuretics we're going to talk about, the thiazides. And these are, these are exemplified by chlorothiazide, chlorthalidone, hydrochlorothiazide, indapamide, and metolazone. And finally, when we enter the collecting tubule, we're going to talk about the potassium, potassium sparing diuretics which are amyloride, aplerinone, spironolactone, and triamterene. We're going to talk about carbonic anhydrase inhibitors first. Remember, carbonic anhydrase on the luminal membrane of the proximal convoluted tubule catalyzes dehydration of carbonic acid to water and carbon dioxide, and that's freely absorbed. So, we think about it for a minute. If we're going to inhibit this enzyme, it's basically going to block sodium bicarbonate reabsorption. And remember what I talked about very early on in this, there's a theme here that water tends to follow sodium. So we're going to get a mild diuresis. Now I have to tell you that in internal medicine, acetazolamide really rarely used clinically as a diuretic. But it's important to talk about because it has lots of other good clinical uses. A little bit about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Acetazolamide is really well absorbed with oral administration. It reaches a maximal effect at about two hours and that effect will persist for around 12 hours. Um, it's again secreted in the proximal convoluted tubule, the S2 segment. What it's going to do is it's going to inhibit about 85 percent of bicarbonate reabsorption. Some is absorbed at other sites in the nephron, so this, it's basically, basically going to result in about a 45% net reabsorption. Now, the reason we don't really use it as a diuretic uh, is because its effect actually decreases over, over several days of use due to bicarbonate depletion. I guess your body just tends to run out, and once it runs out, the, uh, the drug really doesn't work that well anymore as a diuretic. If we don't use carbonic anhydrase inhibitors as diuretics, well, what else, what else are they useful for? Well, they actually have some really nifty clinical uses. Um, the first uh, one I'd like to just kind of mention is actually, it has, uh, you'll find carbonic anhydrase in, uh, in the eye. So we can actually use carbonic anhydrase inhibitors to treat glaucoma. We can, we can use acetazolamide to reduce this aqueous humor formation and thereby decrease intraocular pressure. And believe it or not, it's available topically, so your patient can just jack it in their eye and they're off to the races. Um, the second major clinical use is uh, for acute mountain sickness. Uh, carbonic anhydrase is found in the CSF and acetazolamide upon administration helps to decrease formation of, CS, of, of cerebrospinal fluid as well as decrease the pH of cerebrospinal fluid. 
Now, if you think back to neurology here, it becomes particularly important to think about the pH of cerebrospinal fluid because that is one of the major regulators for the uh, speed of your respiratory drive. So, we, we administer acetazolamide, and what it does is it basically allays the symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, like nausea, dizziness, headache, and it also keeps you from hyperventilating. So, uh, you can tolerate being at, al being at altitude for days on end with this medication. Finally, we use acetazolamide in uh, uh, conditions that produce metabolic alkalosis. I'm not going to go through all of those right now, but it just kind of makes sense that if, you, if uh, you've got an alkalosis, you can correct it by increased secretion from the kidney of carbonic acid. Acetazolamide is going to have some adverse effects. Obviously, if we're getting rid of too much bicarbonate, we can end up with a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, which generally not a good thing. Uh, the second major adverse effect is that you, get, you can actually develop renal stones, and that's because acetazolamide will precipitate out in the urine. Uh, thirdly, you get some renal potassium wasting, and uh, fourthly, uh, acetazolamide can cause drowsiness and paresthesias. Now this is not related, again, to the diuretic effect. It's more related, I think, to the effects on the cerebrospinal fluid. There are also some contraindications to using acetazolamide. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors can contribute to the development of hyperaminemia. And this is particularly bad when you've got cirrhotics with hepatic encephalopathy and uh, well, they get decreased secretion of ammonia in their urine. The urine becomes very alkaline. And needless to say, encephalopathy gets worse. And, well, bad things can happen. So don't give acetazolamide to your cirrhotic patients. Okay, now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time for you to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we're going to go through the quick review in your study guide. So now let's review some of the key points of nephron physiology. We'll also talk a little bit more about acetosolamide. If you look in your study guide, there's a section titled Quick Review 1. So obviously, if you're going to understand the mechanism of action of the diuretics, you're going to need to know a little bit about nephron physiology. So let's review some of that. With number one, the different functional zones of the nephron and the drugs that act on those zones. In the proximal convoluted tubule, you have acetosolamide acting here. In your, uh, and then you have your descending loop of Henle, uh, which we don't have any diuretics that work there. But we, in your ascending loop of Henle, we have uh, your loop diuretics, like furosemide, torsemide, bumetanide, and then ethacrinic acid also works here. In your distal convoluted tubule, you have your thiazide diuretics. And in your collecting duct, you have your potassium-sparing diuretics, spironolactone, aplerinone, amylaride, and triamterene. All are going to work in your collecting duct. Number two, which ions are reabsorbed and which are secreted in the different regions of the nephron? Uh, so this also, again, goes back to understanding the mechanism of action of your different diuretics. So in your proximal tubule, what's reabsorbed is, um, well, most everything is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, but which ions are reabsorbed? You have sodium and potassium, and also water uh, is reabsorbed. What's secreted? You have organic anions and cations secreted in the proximal tubule. So if your body is trying to get rid of a substance and just filtering it through the glomerulus is not sufficient, another way you can get rid of organic anions and cations is by actively secreting it within the proximal tubule um, to go into the urine. In your thick ascending limb, what's reabsorbed, again, is potassium and sodium. And then chloride here is also reabsorbed. Remember, you have that potassium sodium chloride co-transporter. Also, calcium and magnesium are reabsorbed through the paracellular space. In your distal convoluted tubule, what's reabsorbed is sodium and chloride. And uh, in your collecting tubule, you have sodium reabsorption. And again, now you have water reabsorption again. And what's secreted is hydrogen and potassium. Um, so it makes sense that your potassium-sparing diuretics would work in this area. Number three, why does respiratory alkalosis take place when traveling to higher altitudes, and what drug can help correct this acid-base disturbance? Well, when you go to high altitude, 
um, there's less partial pressure of oxygen, right? And so if you have less, less oxygen around, what are you going to do? You're going to breathe more. You're going to become hypoxic. Your body is going to sense that hypoxia. You're going to start to breathe more. So you're going to increase your ventilatory rate. And as you breathe more, increase your breathing rate, not only are you going to be able to oxygenate your body better, but you're also going to blow off more CO2. And when you blow off more CO2, this causes a disruption of your bicarb CO2 balance. And you're going to get a respiratory alkalosis. So you get a respiratory alkalosis at high altitudes because you're breathing more to correct your hypoxia. Now, which drug can you use to help to correct this acid-based disturbance of respiratory alkalosis? Acetosolamide. Uh, so acetosolamide will increase bicarb excretion to get that CO2 bicarb ratio back into balance. Uh, so you're going to increase your bicarb excretion with acetosolamide, help bring the pH back towards normal. Um, acetosolamide also disinhibits your CNS chemoreceptors, which allows you to increase ventilation, and this was previously mentioned in the lecture as well. Number four, what class of diuretic directly affects principal cells? These are your potassium sparing diuretics. Number five, what class of diuretic works at the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter? Loop diuretic. Definitely need to know that. Number six, what are the various uses for acetosolamide? Acetosolamide is not commonly used as a diuretic. Uh, what is it commonly used for? To treat glaucoma. It's commonly used to, uh, for mountain sickness or altitude sickness. Uh, it can be used to correct a, uh, an alkalosis, like a respiratory alkalosis that you would get from mountain sickness. It can also be used to correct a metabolic alkalosis. And then also can be used to alkalinize the urine. So if for some reason you want urinary alkalinization, you might reach for acetosolamide to do that. So that's it for this quick review. Let's get back to your main lecturer. Let's talk about osmotic diuretics next. Most of your textbooks will look at osmotic diuretics and say these are not important and they'll be the very last class of diuretics you talk about. The reason I put them second is because that's really where they come anatomically. They work in the proximal convoluted tubule and they also work in the descending loop of Henle. Both of these areas, remember, are freely permeable to water. So any osmotically active agent that's filtered into that glomerulus but not reabsorbed is going to cause water to be retained in, these, retained in these segments and result in a mild diuresis. Now there's two clinically significant osmotic diuretics that you're going to read about. One is mannitol. That's really the only one that I've used anytime recently. And the second one is urea. You're going to hear about that, but it's really from the nephrologist standpoint that you're going to hear about that one more. Let's concentrate on mannitol for a second. Mannitol is very poorly absorbed in the GI tract. And usually when you take it in the GI tract, it really causes an osmotic diarrhea. So your patients, they're not going to absorb it. It's not going to really get to the kidneys very well. And they're going to end up with some really nice diarrhea for you. So try to avoid that. Um, it's really given IV. And once it reaches the glomerulus, it's fully exc excreted through the glomerulus within about 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, again, the major effect of mannitol happens in the proximal convoluted tubule. And what it's going to do is it's going to reduce sodium as well as water reabsorption. Basically going to lead to water loss and it can lead to a transient hypernatremia. Mannitol has some really interesting clinical uses and um, again, not always, because, not always for the diuretic effect that we're talking about here. Um, mannitol can be used to increase urine volume, and this is specifically important in a couple of different conditions. When you have hemolysis or rhabdomyolysis, it can lead to uh, the production by the body of some very nephrotoxic pigments, which can cause anuria once it damages the kidneys enough. So we use mannitol to really flush out the kidneys maintain the volume of the urine and keep this anuria, anuria from developing. Basically, kind of help the kidneys flush out all those nephrotoxic pigments. Now, the other major use for mannitol that you're going to hear about is reduction of intracranial or intraocular volume. Whenever you've got a stroke, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, intracranial masses, or even just something as simple as, you know, prior ocular surgery, uh, mannitol comes, comes in handy real fast to, uh, to, to diurese that out 
and uh, get that volume down so that uh, you know you don't blow an artery or something like that. Um, mannitol does have some adverse effects. All drugs do. The osmotic effect is really not restricted to the nephron. Mannitol can extract water from cells all over the body. So extracellular volume is going to expand. And anytime extracellular volume expands, it can complicate heart failure and it can cause florid pulmonary edema. Florid pulmonary edema, not a good thing. It can also lead to some pretty significant dehydration. Obviously, we're peeing out a lot of fluid. You're going to dehydrate yourself real, real fast and could end up with acute renal failure. Mannitol also leads to hyperkalemia and hypernatremia in most cases. If you've got diminished renal function, the mannitol is not going to get to where it needs to get to and it will also actually result in a hyponatremia. Now, once we move down from the proximal convoluted tubule, we're going to end up in the loop of Henle. Osmotic diuretics that we just talked about also have a, an effect in the descending limb of the loop of Henle, again because that area does have a permeability to water. Once we enter the ascending loop, and specifically the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, we're going to talk about loop diuretics. This is the primary point of action for uh, loop diuretics. Loop diuretics are going to inhibit the sodium potassium chloride transporter that we talked about earlier that's in the ascending limb of the loop. Now, once we inhibit this transporter, we're going to leave sodium ions, potassium ions, chloride ions in the filtrate. And again, water tends to follow sodium. So, we're not going to have a lot of the water absorption that uh, would normally occur here. Now, downstream sites, downstream I mean the distal convoluted tubule, the collecting, the collecting ducts, they're really unable to compensate for this really high sodium chloride load that they get. So the diuresis that you get from these drugs is super dramatic. Now, the most used of these drugs are furosemide, bumetanide, torsamide, and ethacrinic acid. So to remind you, what's going to happen is that when you administer a loop diuretic, there's going to be a net increase in urinary excretion of sodium, the potassium, calcium, magnesium, and chloride ions. This becomes a particularly important point to remember when we think about the fact that these diuretics are just so darn powerful. I'm going to get back to that in a second. Now, loop diuretics, the great thing about them again is that they're rapidly absorbed and they're eliminated very quickly through the kidney. They have a really rapid half-life. We always learned on the wards that Lasix lasts six hours. After that, you're done. Speaking about pharmacodynamics, you're going to inhibit that sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. Um, the other important thing that happens that I really didn't mention earlier, but uh, becomes important later on, is that uh, loop diuretics are going to induce the expression of the COX-2 receptor, which participates in prostaglandin synthesis. This is important in one of your later lectures. Not really important for, uh, for today's lecture. Let's specifically talk about furosemide and the clinical uses of furosemide. Remember, from what we talked about earlier, that loop diuretics are going to promote the excretion of potassium. So loop diuretics become particularly useful in patients that have hyperkalemia. The uh, second major clinical use is in acute renal failure. What loop diuretics tend to do is promote the, an increased rate of urine flow and enhance potassium excretion. The third major clinical use for it, and I, I want to I preface this by reminding everybody here that I haven't talked anything about uh, the actual diuretic effect of these medications. I've specifically talked about their effect on different ions. So the third major clinical use of this medication is hypercalcemia. If we can get some of that calcium out, it uh, tends to stabilize that heart membrane a little bit. You know, uh, that tends to be important. Again, we're thinking back to physiology. Now, 
Let's talk about the diuretic effect. Loop diuretics are the drug of choice for congestive heart failure. They're also the drug of choice for acute pulmonary edema because of their rapid onset. And what they do, what they've been shown to do over time and time again is to reduce pulmonary congestion. They've also been shown to decrease left ventricular filling pressures prior to the diuresis. Furosemide does have some adverse effects. Uh, it can cause ototoxicity. That's probably one of the most common things you'll hear from your patients. Doctor, my ears are hurting and I cannot hear anything. It's just super common. Now, uh, there are some other effects that I want you to, again, think about the physiology of what we've talked about. Loop diuretics can promote hyperuricemia. Uh, they can also promote acute hypovolemia. Kind of makes sense. They can promote hypokalemia. They can also cause hypomagnesemia. Now, that's a lot of hypos and hypers and all that. Basically, they can disturb the electrolyte balance just enough to where you can have some serious cardiac effects and you may have, you know, a little bit worse than that. The final adverse uh, effect that uh, bears some mentioning is that uh, furosemide and the other loop diuretics are sulfonamides. So there is some cross-reactivity between uh, uh, sulfonamides and uh, patients who have the dreaded sulfa allergies, but those uh, sulfa allergies tend to be uh, with antibiotics as opposed to these sulfonamides. We're going to talk about thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics act in the distal convoluted tubule by blocking the sodium chloride co-transporter on the filtrate side of the membrane. So what happens here is that this promotes a moderate diuresis and also leaves you with uh, fairly hyperosmolar urine. Uh, the thiazides are chlorothiazide and hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide is pr pretty much the one that I use most often in my practice. You're also going to hear about uh, several other diuretics. Some, some, depending on which books you read, some of them are going to call these thiazide diuretics. I tend to refer to them as thiazide-like diuretics. They're chlorthalidone, metolazone, and endapamide. The reason it, that they're thiazide-like diuretics is because they act in similar fashions and along the same physiologic pathways, but they uh, tend to be structurally different. Uh, thiazide diuretics uh, can be administered orally, and uh, chlorothiazide, which is not really used very often anymore clinically, has to be given in really large doses. Hydrochlorothiazide tends to be, tends to, tends to be effective in pretty small doses. Um, I mentioned earlier that the thiazide-like diuretics are a little bit different, and endapamide, which is one of them, is actually excreted via the biliary system. Now, all the rest go out through the kidneys. Um, what bears mentioning here is that from a pharmacokinetic standpoint, uh, thiazide diuretics compete with uric acid for secretion in the proximal convoluted tubule, and that's how they can induce hyperuricemia. To summarize how they work, thiazide diuretics will increase excretion of sodium and chloride. They'll promote loss of potassium and magnesium via the urine. And you'll also get a decreased urinary excretion of calcium. Finally, the one other nice effect of thiazide diuretics is that they tend to reduce peripheral vascular resistance. So they tend to be useful in things like congestive heart failure and hypertension. Now, it's really primarily used in mild to moderate hypertension. Uh, thiazide diuretics tend to be one of the drugs of choice because they're relatively inexpensive and they're very well tolerated drugs. They're also used very specifically in congestive heart failure. Some internists will use them first line. Uh, they tend to reduce the extracellular volume and reduce edema associated with this congestive heart failure. Um, some non-edematous uses of this drug include 
hypercalciuria, what uh, these thiazide diuretics do is decrease calcium excretion in the urine, thereby decreasing the formation of specific types of kidney stones like calcium oxalate. They're also used for the treatment of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. You can imagine that when we look at our diagrams about uh, the distal convoluted tubule and think about all these different uh, electrolytes, that uh, hydrochlorothiazide and the di thiazide diuretics have some pretty significant adverse effects. First of all, you can develop a hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, which kind of makes sense. Think about it. Second, you get hyperuricemia. That means you really can't use these drugs in patients that have gout because their toe hurts and you put, them hyper you, put, you put them on the hydrochlorothiazide and all of a sudden, toe hurts even more. They can also lead to significant potassium depletion, which can cause muscle cramping and muscle weakness. And these drugs can also promote hyponatremia and volume depletion. They can promote hypercalcemia, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, and hypersensitivity. That's a lot of hypers in there, but uh, the only real contraindication to thiazide diuretic use is uh, in uh, patients who demonstrate uh, clear hypersensitivity to these drugs. Now, that's not to say that uh, you know these are otherwise very safe. Uh, you want to remember that excessive use of any diuretic is dangerous in any patient with hepatic cirrhosis, borderline renal failure, or significant uh, congestive heart failure. You just got to be real careful and monitor electrolytes when you're doing any of these things. Okay, now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time for you to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we're going to go through the quick review in your study guide. Which class of diuretics decreases urinary calcium excretion and may cause hypercalcemia? I'm waiting. Thiazides. And which class of diuretics most strongly increases urinary calcium excretion and may cause calcium stones? You are completely clueless, aren't you? Loop diuretics. Pull your head out and get in the game. All right, now let's review some of the key points uh, that you need to know regarding mannitol, loops, and thiazide diuretics. If you look on your study guide, there's a section titled Quick Review 2. That's what we're going to be referring to. So take a look at question number one. How can mannitol have an adverse effect of either hypono hyponatremia and hypernatremia? So this can be kind of confusing, right? Um, so when you give mannitol, uh, it's an osmol, right? So you infuse it IV, and this is going to increase the osmolarity of the blood. So as you increase osmolarity in the blood, what's going to happen? You're going to have a bunch of water going into the blood, right? So you get a transient hyponatremia because mannitol is, an ex is exerting an osmotic effect within circulation that pulls free water from the interstitium into circulation. So that's why you get the hyponatremia. Now, as as you continue to infuse the mannitol, as mannitol continues to circulate through the body and eventually gets to the kidney and starts to uh, become a osmol in the urine, um, then mannitol will then be pulling free water from, um, from the circulation into the urine. And so as that happens, as you get rid of free water, as you start to lose free water um, and, and lose um, uh, out of proportion to sodium loss, now you can get hypernatremia. So you can get a transient hyponatremia initially, and if you lose too much free water, you're going to get a hypernatremia. So one of the things you look for when you're dosing mannitol is you're going to continually check the sodium levels of the patient as well as the serum osmolarity. Number two, why can mannitol be used to treat renal failure and shock, yet it can cause renal failure? Another one of these strange things with mannitol. Um, so, uh, it, what this has to do with is whether there's adequate fluid in the system. So, in the presence of adequate fluid, uh, mannitol will prevent renal failure by maintaining your urine flow in the renal tubules. And in the uh, absence of adequate fluid, um, due to excessive dehydration, possibly by mannitol, 
the kidneys will be poorly perfused with blood, causing renal failure. So if there's enough fluid around, then mannitol can work. It can pull fluid into the kidneys. It's going to help flush out the kidneys. If there's not enough fluid around, mannitol may not work so well, and that can cause renal failure. Number three, what mnemonic can, help you, you, can you use to remember the treatment of acute pulmonary edema? Very easy mnemonic, L-M-N-O-P, L-M-N-O-P. The L, uh, so we're talking about you know, heart failure, left-sided heart failure causing pulmonary edema. Patient can't breathe because the, the lungs are filled with fluid. What are you going to do in that case? L-M-N-O-P. Loop, L is for loop diuretics, like Lasix or, uh, is the brand name. Furosemide is a generic name. So loop diuretics is an L. M is morphine. N is for nitrates. O is for oxygen. They might just need supplemental oxygen by mask. They might need to be intubated to get enough oxygen. Uh, and then the P uh, is for positioning. So what you're going to do is have the patient sit up, have their legs down so the fluid goes to their legs. Fluid in the legs is not going to kill you. Fluid in the lungs will. Uh, and the other P is for pressors. So patients with heart failure, they might need something like dobutamine to help stimulate the contractility of the heart so that the heart can, um, um, can pull fluid, so to speak, from the lungs and continue it in through circulation to get to the kidneys. Number four, uh, what drugs are considered sulfa drugs that should generally be avoided in sulfa allergic patients? So the most obvious drug category here is sulfonamide antibiotics. Um, but a lot of your diuretics, loop diuretics with the exception of ethacrinic acid, thiazide diuretics are considered sulfa drugs, and acetosolamide is also a sulfa drug. So three different types of diuretics are all um, considered sulfa drugs. Sulfasalazine is a drug that can be used to treat inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis is also a sulfa drug. Sulfonylureas, uh, these are drugs used to treat diabetic patients. Uh, Probenicid is a sulfa drug, and celecoxib, which is a COX-2 inhibitor, is also a sulfa drug. So you have sulfonamide antibiotics, your diuretics including loops, thiazides, acetosolamide, sulfasalazine, sulfonylureas, probenicid, and celecoxib. Now, if you're allergic to sulfonamide antibiotics, does that mean you can't take any of these other drugs? Maybe, all right? Um, and you're, if you are considering using one of these other drugs, you might want to use a test dose. Uh, it, if you're allergic to one, doesn't mean you're necessarily allergic to all of them, but you do have a higher risk of being allergic to, to these other drugs in this category. Number five, what diuretic is used in sulfa allergic patients when diuresis is required? I just uh, mentioned this one, it's ethacrinic acid. Number six, which diuretic can cause hypocalcemia, which can cause hypercalcemia? This is hugely testable, guys. Make sure you know this. Loops lose calcium thiazides retain calcium. Little phrase, make sure you know it. Loops lose calcium, thiazides retain calcium. If you know that, you're going to be just fine. So loops lose calcium. So loop diuretics like furosemide, uh, they lose calcium into the urine. So it's going to be useful to treat things like hypercalcemia. Who has hypercalcemia? Patients with excess parathyroid hormone have hypercalcemia. Patients with malignancy, Vitamin D in excess can cause hypercalcemia. There's lots of different reasons why you might have hypercalcemia. If you have that and you need to resolve that, one of the things that can help is a loop diuretic. Thiazides retain calcium. So when would you want to retain calcium in your circulation? Um, maybe you have calcium renal stones, and so thiazide diuretics are going to help prevent that. Um, now, if you have hypercalcemia and that's causing your renal stones, obviously you're not going to give a thiazide to prevent the renal stones but exacerbate your hypercalcemia. But um, in other scenarios where you have renal stones uh, that are calcium stones, thiazides may be helpful. One other interesting thing about thiazides, they can help reduce the incidence of osteoporosis because they retain calcium in the circulation. So it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, diuretic for that use. Number seven, what diuretic combination is commonly used in patients with cirrhosis to reduce intra-abdominal ascites? So this combination is spironolactone and furosemide. You give the two together. It's used, both of them are given in high doses um, at the same time. And the combination is going to prevent potassium disturbances. Um, so one of them, you know, your loops are going to lose potassium. Your spironolactone is going to retain potassium. Um, so uh, the combination is going to maintain normokalemia. Number eight, which diuretic is commonly given as a first-line antihypertensive? 
You're going to see this used a lot clinically. It's hydrochlorothiazide, commonly abbreviated as HCTZ. And it can be uh, given alone or it can be given with a potassium sparing diuretic or it can be given in combination with an ACE inhibitor. So you're going to see all those different combinations uh, for hydrochlorothiazide. Very common drug. Uh, number nine, what is the most potent thiazide diuretic? This is metolazone. Metolazone is very potent. And then uh, number 10, what is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? And what is the diuretic of choice to treat it? Now, um, you know, you, we can have a whole lecture on nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Let me just give you a little bit of background as to what this is. So diabetes insipidus results when you have an absence of antidiuretic hormone. So what does antidiuretic hormone do? It causes antidiuresis. So you don't, you don't diurese fluid, you retain fluid. So antidiuretic hormone, whenever it's around, you retain fluid. In this case, you do not have antidiuretic hormone. So you're getting rid of fluid. You're diuresing because you have an absence of antidiuretic hormone. Now there's two different flavors of diabetes insipidus. There's central diabetes insipidus, where you don't make antidiuretic hormone. And the way you treat that is to give antidiuretic hormone. It can be given intranasally. This is desmopressin. The other flavor of diabetes insipidus is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And in this case, you actually do have antidiuretic hormone. Your kidneys just don't recognize it the way that they're supposed to. So how do we treat that? You know, if you give more antidiuretic hormone, that's not going to do anything. You already have it around. So how do we treat nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? You give hydrochlorothiazide. Makes sense, right? You might be thinking, no, that doesn't really make sense. Hydrochlorothiazide. So you have all this diuresis taking place. I have an idea. Let's give a diuretic. That doesn't really make sense, does it? Don't think about diabetes insipidus as excessive diuresis. Think about it as excessive free water loss. All right, so how does hydrochlorothiazide help with that? When you give hydrochlorothiazide, it's going to cause a mild hypovolemia. So you're going to lose a little bit too much fluid with hydrochlorothiazide on board. It's going to cause a mild hypovolemia. And what that's going to do then is encourage the kidneys. It's going to stimulate the kidneys to retain water in the proximal tubule. All right, so because you have a problem with the, with the collecting tubules where um, ADH works, we are now going to cause a hypovolemia that stimulates the proximal tubules to do the job that the collecting tubules should have done. All right, so by giving hydrochlorothiazide, it stimulates the kidneys to retain more water in the proximal tubule so that you can um, get back to a normal volemia. So that's how hydrochlorothiazide treats nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Let's rejoin Dr. Vora working his way through the nephron. We're in the collecting tubules, one of my favorite spots, and we're going to talk about potassium sparing diuretics here, the fifth class of, of drugs. Potassium sparing diuretics act in the collecting tubules to inhibit sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion. Now, there's two classes within the potassium sparing diuretics. There's a group of these drugs that actually antagonize aldosterone receptors directly, and those are spironolactone and eplerinone. Now, the second group actually inhibits sodium influx through the ion channels in the tubular membrane. And these are amyloride and triamterene. Potassium sparing diuretics are absorbed really easily and uh, travel directly to that collecting tubule site. What they're going to do there is they're going to promote the retention of potassium. That's why they're called dun 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 potassium sparing diuretics. It's like the loop diuretics. Someone gets paid millions of dollars to come up with these names. It's great. Spironolactone actually antagonizes the aldosterone receptor. So, remembering, remembering what we talked about earlier, what that's going to do is that's going to block sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion in the principal cells. And when you do that, guess what happens? Well, sodium flows out in the urine and water follows right along with it. Potassium sparing diuretics are useful in several conditions. I want to start out again with the non-edematous conditions that this is useful for. Uh, very useful in treating primary hyperaldosteronism. Kind of makes sense. We're going to bro block that aldosterone receptor. Remember, these are 
diseases like Kahn syndrome or uh, ectopic ACTH production. Um, not going to go too much more into those here in the, in the setting of this lecture. Um, it's also useful in conditions that cause secondary hyperaldosteronism. And you'll remember back from endocrinology, uh, things like congestive heart failure, hepatic cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome. These are all edematous conditions. And uh, these, uh, again, promote hyperaldosteronism, which we can block that aldosterone receptor with these, with these potassium sparing diuretics. Um, they're also clinically useful in these settings for other reasons. Uh, potassium sparing diuretics are the drug of choice in hepatic cirrhosis, specifically in the volume overload of hepatic cirrhosis. They're also a drug of choice in congestive heart failure where these potassium sparing diuretics actually prevent cardiac remodeling secondary to cardiomyopathy. Again, nice little clinical tidbits. There are some adverse effects that are related to potassium sparing diuretics. Aldactone, spironolactone can cause GI upset. They can also promote ulcers. Uh, the, uh, you know, you want to be careful giving it to men because spironolactone has been associated with gynecomastia, which is not always fun for most men. Uh, potassium sparing diuretics via their name uh, can result in uh, potassium being held in the system and ba basically can lead to hyperkalemia. And when we switch gears and go to a couple of these diuretics specifically, triamterene is the one I want you to remember. It can cause kidney stones because it tends to precipitate in the urine. There are some contraindications to the use of potassium sparing diuretics, uh, specifically chronic renal insufficiency. Obviously, you don't want to give a patient uh, too much of this, this type of a drug if they're already prone to the hyperkalemia that is associated with chronic renal insufficiency. You just make them more hyperkalemic, and again, unless you're trying to off your patient, I don't really recommend it. Okay, now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time for you to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we're going to go through the quick review in your study guide. <laughs> Ginger, you are too much. <laughs> you know, I heard the best one the other day. What drugs cause gynecomastia? Some drugs create awesome knockers. <laughs> Get it? Spironolactone, digitalis, sumetidine, alcohol, and ketoconazole. Now, I don't know exactly, but I'm pretty sure that awesome means swell. <laughs> All right, let's go over the answers to the questions in your end session quiz. The first question, match the diuretic to the location in the nephron on which each acts. So the first one is acetazolamide. Remember, that's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, and that acts in the proximal convoluted tubule. The second one is hydrochlorothiazide. Well, that's easy. That's a thiazide, and those act in the distal convoluted tubule. The next one is furosemide, and that's a loop diuretic. So it works in the loop of Henle, in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. You've got to know furosemide is a loop diuretic. It's one of the most common loop diuretics that's used. And then the last drug, spironolactone. It acts in the collecting duct and tubule because it's a potassium-sparing diuretic. Next question, which diuretic or class of diuretics would be most useful in each of the following situations? First one, edema associated with nephrotic syndrome. Well, we're looking for a loop diuretic. Remember, patients with nephrotic syndrome have renal disease. You need a really strong diuretic. Remember, Dr. Boris said that loops cause super dramatic diuresis, and that's true. So you use a loop diuretic when you have uh, ed an edematous state such as uh, nephrotic syndrome. The next one, it increased intracranial pressure. Remember Dr. Bora talked about using mannitol because that's an osmotic diuretic and that osmotic load is going to draw fluid out of brain cells. It doesn't just act in the kidney, it also acts in other tissues. So the osmotic load of mannitol draws uh, fluid out of the brain cells and into the interstitium, out of the interstitium into the vascular space and it's going to reduce brain swelling. 
Next one, mild to moderate hypertension. Remember, thiazide diuretics are first-line therapy for patients with mild to moderate hypertension. Thiazides reduce the intravascular volume and reduce afterload, and therefore they lower the blood pressure. Next, uh, next one is hypercalcemia. And again, we want to use a loop diuretic because loops lose calcium. So you're going to help your body excrete the calcium, and loop diuretics can help treat hypercalcemia. Next one is altitude sickness. Remember, we talked about using carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, such as acetazolamide, for altitude sickness. The next one, hyperaldosteronism. Well, if you have too much aldosterone, you want to use an aldosterone antagonist, specifically spironolactone or a plerinone. And then the last one, acne treatment. Uh, you can use spironolactone to treat acne. Spironolactone is uh, very structurally similar to androgens. It will actually block androgen receptors to a certain extent. And so you can use spironolactone to uh, block the androgen receptor and reduce the effects of acne. Next question, what is the net effect on urinary excretion of the following ions with administration of the following diuretics? So the first column is sodium. And all of these diuretics increase excretion of sodium because water follows sodium out of the body. The next column, potassium. Now remember, thiazides and loop diuretics and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, such as acetazolamide, all increase potassium excretion. They can all lead to hypokalemia. So all of those diuretics will increase potassium excretion. The exception are the potassium sparing diuretics. These can reduce potassium excretion and can sometimes actually cause hyperkalemia. So the only one that causes reduced excretion of potassium are the potassium sparing diuretics. And then the third column, calcium. Remember, loops lose calcium, but so do most of the rest of these. The loop diuretics cause you to lose calcium, as do uh, potassium sparing diuretics and acetazolamide. The exception in this case is the thiazides. Remember, thiazides cause the body to retain calcium. They reduce the urinary excretion of calcium. Next question, match the following clinical descriptions with the most appropriate single therapeutic agent. And the first one is a 64-year-old man with hepatic cirrhosis. The answer we're looking for is spironolactone. Now, in a patient with cirrhosis, you have poor liver synthetic function. So the liver can't make albumin like it normally would. When you don't have much albumin, you don't have the osmotic force to keep fluid in the vasculature. So fluid is going to leave the vasculature and you get edema. Well, part of the re one of the results of that low intravascular volume is that the kidneys perceive the blood pressure as being low and that stimulates secretion of aldosterone. So in edematous state, in edematous state such as cirrhosis, you get secondary hyperaldosteronism. So if you have too much aldosterone, you want to reach for an aldosterone antagonist like spironolactone. Now, if you also need a strong diuretic because of all the edema, you might add a loop diuretic. Next one is an 83-year-old woman needing treatment for chronic open-angle glaucoma. Remember, we talked about treating uh, open-angle glaucoma with eye drops made of the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor acetazolamide. So you can use acetazolamide eye drops for the treatment of glaucoma. The next one is a 70-year-old man with calcium oxalate kidney stones. Now remember, thiazide diuretics, such as hydrochlorothiazide, will reduce urinary calcium excretion. So there's less calcium in the urine to make stones. Now remember also, not all kidney stones are made of calcium, so you need to have the patient strain the urine, collect the stone, and you can send it to the lab and test it and find out the composition. And if it is a calcium stone, then uh, you, can use, uh, you can use thiazides to treat this. And the last patient is a 58-year-old woman with acute pulmonary edema. Remember, Dr. J talked about the mnemonic LMNOP, and the L was for Lasix or also for loop diuretics. And on your list there, bumetanide is a loop diuretic. Remember, loop diuretics cause a rapid, significant diuresis. They remove fluid from the pulmonary interstitium so the patient isn't drowning from the pulmonary edema. All right, next question. Classify the following diuretics as either thiazide, loop, or potassium-sparing diuretics. Well, the first category are the thiazides. These are relatively easy. You've got chlorothiazide and hydrochlorothiazide. And then in that category, we'll also lump the thiazide-like diuretics, including chlorothaladone, metolazone, and endapamide. Then we have the loop diuretics, which include furosemide, torsemide, bumetanide, and ethacrinic acid. And then the rest of them are the potassium-sparing diuretics. 
Uh, I remember which ones are potassium sparing, but I remember that K for potassium, K stays. And it stay spelled S-T-A, uh, in, it stands for spironolactone, triamterene, amylaride, and then a plerinone. Next question. What is the site of action of mannitol? Well, remember, mannitol is an osmotic diuretic. It acts in the proximal convoluted tubule and also in the descending limb of the loop of Henle. It's the only diuretic that works in the descending limb of the loop of Henle. These sites are both freely permeable to water, and so the osmotic load just sucks the water back into the lumen. And what is the site of action of the thiazides? Well, the thiazides work in the distal convoluted tubule. Next question, what class of drugs inhibit the sodium potassium chloride symporter or co-transporter in the thick ascending limb? Well, first of all, it's the thick ascending limb of what? Well, it's the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And what kind of diuretics act in the loop of Henle? Loop diuretics. Pretty simple. Like Dr. Boris said, somebody got paid millions of dollars to think of that? Really? Next question, what diuretic or class of diuretic would be most useful in the following situation? For acute pulmonary edema, remember we just talked about it, LMNOP, loop diuretics for acute pulmonary edema. For hypercalciuria, causing stones, remember which diuretic reduces calcium in the urine? The thiazides. So you can use thiazides to treat hypercalciuria, which causes kidney stones. What about glaucoma? We already mentioned acetazolamide eye drops for glaucoma. And if you have a patient with mild to moderate congestive heart failure, with expanded extracellular volume? Well, if they have mild CHF, you can probably get away with using hydrochlorothiazide. It causes a decent diuresis, it's cheap, it's safe. But if they have acute congestive heart failure or severe congestive heart failure, you need to pull out your big guns. You need to get a loop diuretic. You could also use loop diuretics for mild congestive heart failure, but you can often get away with a, a thiazide. And then the last one, which diuretic would you use in conjunction with a loop or a thiazide diuretic to retain potassium? Remember, loops and thiazides often cause hypokalemia. This can be a big problem. You need to put the patient on a large dose of, of diuretic. You really need to get a good diuresis, but they're getting very low potassium. So you have to either supplement potassium uh, or you put them on a potassium-sparing diuretic in conjunction with their loop or thiazide. Usually we use spironolactone or triamterene. They actually sell a combination pill of hydrochlorothiazide and triamterene, both drugs together in the same pill. So the patient just takes one pill, but they get the benefits of both diuretics. Next question. What side effect might spironolactone cause that a plerinone does not? Well, you can get gynecomastia from spironolactone. Um, so men can have gynecomastia or breast development. About 9% of men who take spironolactone will get some gynecomastia. Women can get some menstrual irregularities. This has to do with the fact that spironolactone um, is an anti-androgen as well as being an anti-aldosterone. Um, so you can get some uh, cross-reactivity with the androgen receptors and other sex hormone receptors. Now, aplerinone has less structural similarity to the sex hormones, so you get fewer endocrine effects. Only about 1% of patients on aplerinone will get um, gynecomastia compared to 9% of patients with spironolactone. And the last one, which diuretics can cause serum acidosis? Well, this includes the uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and the potassium-sparing diuretics. And that's the end of your end-of-session quiz.